Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Subscribers not only receive all new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly, including me, which... Sure. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, videos, and written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links that you're going to find in the show notes. All right. Well, today I am so honored to be speaking with Victoria Peltier. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Oh my gosh. I can't tell you. I, I have been looking, well, you know what? Let me actually finish the introduction. Victoria is an award-winning executive leader, a number one best-selling author, and a motivational speaker. And if you go to Victoria's website, so victoriapeltier.com, you will find that's, there's a dash in there. Damn it. It's victoria-peltier.com. You will find some amazing stories. And I saw Victoria's message, first of all, about um, it was really it was being unstoppable. And um, you know very well, being a member also of the, the LGBTQ community, sometimes we face adversity occasionally. And uh, your story about actually going further than just, you know, living a good life, but actually thriving, becoming the level, getting to the level of success you have, I just knew I had to, to talk to you. So it's a great story. So I, I want to start off, I mean, because nobody else knows your story. Can you just tell me, um, you know, what's, what happened in childhood that, that could have left you at a place where many of us are, where we just go, ugh, I've got a sense of powerlessness. Uh, yeah, I think the origin story for me that I didn't always tell as openly as I do now is it is a big part of who I am, where my drive, where my purpose comes from, and the kind of impact I now want to have on the world. And I'm, so I'm born to a drug addicted teenage mother who was very abusive to me was in and out of the child welfare system a number of times until thankfully at one point my biological mother Julie and I don't call she's bio mom only I refer to her as Julie my parents are those that adopted me after a number of times of like an episode um Julie asked a couple to keep me for a few days and after this happened a number of times um, this couple asked her to adopt me to get me out of that environment. So I'm very fortunate that I was adopted out of the abusive environment that I was in lower socioeconomic, um, uh, home in, in that my dad was a janitor or mama secretary, but no food insecurity, but meant I started working very young. Uh, but a combination of the abuse, the, the way I saw it, rejection, uh, from my biological mother, uh, and all that trauma I had suffered created both. I had literal, um, you know, scars, but also figuratively as well in terms of the walls I built up around myself. And um, I share that so openly now because there are so many challenges, obstacles, adversity that we face, and that's where the unstoppable comes from. I made a choice that my biology and the circumstances of childhood, socioeconomic, there was a sexual abuse incident that happened in my early teens as well, that none of that stuff was going to stop me uh, from achieving the goals and objectives I'd set for myself. What was, how do you make that choice? I mean, what is it, how do you go from like, I mean, let me actually try this a different way. Did you feel powerless at some point? And then you say, no, no more. Now I am going to, to pull myself forward. Or was it a, a consistent drive? I think there is, in my case, there's a strong element of DNA. I do believe <laughs> you can build the muscle around resiliency and in fact, sure. I had to build a healthy way of being resilient because I've always been resilient, but compartmentalizing and not processing is not healthy in my opinion. But the I DNA see. component, fight or flight, 
I'm a fighter and I always have been. And so even though I, you know, dealt with a lot as a child, even just, I'm not going to say stupid stuff, but like, I mean, I was gifted yet teachers didn't know how to deal with that. I hit my height by the time I was like 11 years old. So I was always the tallest kid in the class, taller than my teacher. Um, I developed extremely early. So just lots of things I constantly dealt with and, you know, you know, was teased for this or that. I just think all of that continued to build this resilience uh, mm -hmm. and just hardened my resolve that uh, I was going to be better then. And in better than, I think, you know, I compared myself probably to others earlier. Now for me, it's, I want to be a better version of myself today than I was yesterday. Mm. Now that makes good sense. So, so resilience though, that's resili resilience and resiliency. These are, you know, they're big words being thrown around today. Is this something I mean, you've always had it, you're saying, but is that something you think we can develop? I think we, we can. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard though. Um, and so again, I think there's something innately. I, I look at my, my younger child who, you know, suffers from mental health issues and, and others who sort of compared themselves to me at some point around mm. everything I went through. And, you know, he says, I like, I don't know. I can't do it. Like, so I, that, that's that, that kind of the innate piece, but I do think you, some of it's a mind, just a purely a mindset also, like you make choice in terms of how you will move forward. But the part where like a muscle, I do think you can develop is things like the ability to be incredibly self-aware and self-reflective on things. What accountability do I have in this situation? What choices yeah. do I have to move forward? In, in some cases, it's also modeling the thinking as much as the the acts and the behavior uh, um, and steps we take to move forward. And those need to be strategic and often with incredible amount of intention. And we also ne need to get very comfortable with discomfort because mm. being resilient, taking steps forward uh, oftentimes is very uncomfortable. But I actually think if we don't lean into that, then um, the growth doesn't come. Yeah. Gosh, there are two things I want to follow up on. Um, let me start actually with, with the idea of, of being uncomfortable. Um, you know, each of us, I mean, particularly like I was going to say, or like I was saying in the LGBT community, much of what we face is, is this discomfort just being in society because many of us, some of us are, you know, are, are on a firing line almost literally, um, discomfort's kind of like a, a way of, a way of life. But, well, actually, let me stop there. Can you speak more on, about discomfort? Yeah, I mean, I do it in all facets of my life. So as it relates to being part of the queer community, I came out at 14 as mm. bisexual, although I vacillated on the spectrum as no, I'm a lesbian too. Now I prefer, I prefer the term queer, although my younger sure. one says, mom, you should just say you're pansexual. I'm like, that word didn't exist when I was younger. So right. for me... So I'm like, for me, I choose queer, but I also know for boomers and beyond that also means something like it was much, had much mm -hmm. more of a negative connotation for me. It means right. I'm not straight. Uh, and, and I should say of my two children, my younger one is trans male. Um, oh, wow. and so, uh, I've been really put into uncomfortable situations. I've always been out. I brought my ex-wife to, um, you know, the holiday parties at work. And I did, however, um, at early on, more from a client perspective, not the people I worked with, I played the pronoun games, my other half, da, 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 just because I was sure. not sure how they were going to view things. But that right. was a place I, I put myself out consistently to, for me, I became an executive at a very young age. Uh, and so I was you know, imposter syndrome, although I don't love that phrase, but um, it, it is a great way to describe how I felt at that point. So I was uncomfortable. I'm not a fan of like, you know, wearing a mask, but, um, and fake it till you make it, except when it comes to confidence. Now I wore different masks because I was a 24 year old female queer lesbian or um, queer executive. And yeah. um, actually I think at the time I identify as a lesbian. And so I just didn't feel like I belonged there. So I did actually wear masks. I'm happy I took off and I wouldn't show vulnerability. Um, I wouldn't show emotion because I didn't want anyone to question why I was there. Um, and so sure. 
that was a place I leaned into the discomfort. Um, and I've done it time and time again to the point where now, certainly in the work world, that rarely, rarely will I feel intimidation. I am confident in, you know, what I, um, the skills I've gained, the experience I've gained, but there's still many situations where it's new or different. Uh, you know, I'm even in career transition now, so I'm about to step into a new role. That's going to be uncomfortable. And I just think again, one foot in front of the other, dip the toe in. It's not going to be comfortable, but over time it gets significantly better. Sure. So, so is your, is your advice, if it feel, if it feels uncomfortable, that might be a good learning experience. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Embrace it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you and Nietzsche, right? I mean, that's the, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger sort of, sort of sense. Yes. I mean, you know, not, not like I'm reading a lot of Nietzsche these days, but, but, um, I mean, it is diff that is difficult. Um, you also brought up self-awareness. Mm. And I think of, I mean, at least in the, the work that I've done, I've thought that introspection is one of the most important characteristics. It's not really like activities that I think we can do. The ability to look at ourselves and see see where we are, you know, including in space, you know, where we are. Um, I, I think that's one of the biggest one of the best uh, skills we can develop. So could you speak a little bit more about self-awareness? I mean, is it the same as what I'm saying with introspection? Uh, it's slightly nuanced, you know, for me. So I do think we need to look inwards, but the reflection for me, the, the way in which I think it, then the differentiation is, is, a, is more of the awareness of, and I think, uh, and I'm, far from perfect. It's funny. I was telling someone yesterday who asked me a question around, am I a patient individual? And I, <laughs> and I said, uh, despite all of my self-reflection and the fact that I'm very aware of things, I said, I have yet to uncover why I have an extreme amount of patience from a work perspective, but almost next to none personally. Uh, <laughs> so I, so I, I, I you know, understand I think that. I, so I think, um, I do think it's so important though. Like when many people are unhappy in situations, at some point, the common denominator is you, you. So yes. like, let's look inward and see what, what is it about the situation? What is it about me that doesn't fit maybe in the situation? And then we can find alternatives. Hmm. Oh gosh, though. But if you, if you're looking at what part of you doesn't fit, but you're trying to embrace the discomfort, the, I guess, where's the, uh, <laughs> there's well, a push and pull. Well, there, there is. Uh, and but I, so I, I think you need to know yourself greatly to understand why you're not happy in a situation. And so I will use the example of like, you know, I left one company a number of years ago and went to another and I realized like, I still wasn't happy. And I'm like, again, I'm the common denominator here. So right. what, what is it? And yes, there were some things about the culture and the leadership that I didn't like in the one, but there were some dynamics in the second. I'm like, so those very large companies are not changing. What is it about me? And so I needed to evaluate. Am I just not comfortable with what they're asking? And in this case, no, I just, I know myself. I don't enjoy this certain slice and the way they were, you know, expecting for it to work. Uh, and so in that case, I know myself. And so I need to find a change. If it's not going to exist in a different role or environment here within this organization, then I'm going to make a change. But you do need to go through, is it just, I'm uncomfortable doing what they're asking, or is it just really not a fit with who I am as a human, what I enjoy? I've made a decision. I don't do things that personally or professionally that don't bring me joy or value. I say, I no, see. I delegate or outsource. And in this case, it didn't bring me joy. So it wasn't a matter of comfort, but I will encourage people to do that hardcore reflection because if it's just that you're nervous or uncomfortable or questioning yourself and your ability, then I'm going to say you stick with it and lean into the discomfort versus the example I gave for me. All right. No, that makes sense. Cause now, now you're making a distinction between being self-aware and being honest with yourself as well. Cause it's pretty easy to go, wow, you know what? I am the asshole here. And then, you know, just kind of do nothing with it. Right. I mean, you, I, there's a quote I pulled actually off of your website that you, that you would make that, that you have made the choice to lead. Mm. I think that is kind of, uh, 
it's it, it forces you into this honesty with yourself. Uh, yeah, I um, I I think I remember my my mom sitting me down for hours as a teenager to be very self aware and reflective. Like Tori, why are you doing these things? And I hated it at the time, but I actually think that's that skill she taught me, although I didn't fully utilize it till later in my twenties, probably, and, and very much in my thirties and beyond, um, has al- allowed me to, um, again, be highly acutely, you know, aware now, um, uh, of, you know, how, how I'm just going to move forward. And in this case around that, you know, born to, I actually have on it. I don't know if it's fully on there, but I have it in my LinkedIn profile, born to lead, um, not to follow, uh, but again, that's a, you know, and it's not that it's not that I don't, you know, I work in a hierarchy, I have bosses. So it's, it's, right. but it's just, it, it, it is a conscious choice for me. Um, and I'm, I operate with radical candor uh, from a place of care and compassion. If you read Kim Scott's book, who's coined, right. coined that phrase, uh, but I'm all, all other things around how I choose to lead. I'm very focused on doing the right thing. And I'm incredibly values and integrity driven. That takes confidence and it takes courage because that means saying no and standing up in the face of many things and working in publicly traded companies as I've had, I I have been, um, that can be hard sometimes. Yeah. Well, it also, it also requires a definition of your values, right? I mean, and many of us that I've seen don't want don't necessarily want to define those to ourselves because we may end up looking at something and going, oh gosh, my value was to become a billionaire. And that's <laughs> why I'm a jerk. But, you know, so so integrity, you have to have values that you truly believe in that I think are going to end up contributing to, you know, contributing to society. Because otherwise, you you know, if, you, if you're honest with yourself, and I mean, maybe that's sort of a, a question I want to ask. I mean, what if you are a jerk? Self-awareness is painful. Honesty with yourself ends up being painful. Uh, it can be. And I also <laughs> encourage people to find the friends around you that are going to be radically candid with you. Because there's some blinders yes. up sometimes. You can oh be incredibly self-aware, but there's some things you are not seeing. So find the tribe that's going to be like at, brutally honest if needed with you. And But I also, so I, I sign up, Beyond unstoppable, I also sign a lot of my social media off with hashtag no excuses. And by that, mm-hmm. you have a choice. So if you've discovered that you're an, you're an asshole, okay, well, you have a choice in terms, are you going to work to change that? Or are you like, you're, that's going to impact you from work, relationships, a whole bunch of other things. That That's a choice. So you can't complain about the fact that your colleagues don't like you or your friends don't like you if you're not prepared to make that change. So again, that's that's all about choice as well. Oh, agreed. Um, I wanted to. There, there was actually a, a point that you made uh, having to having to just you know figure out how you were going to to. I don't know. I want to use the word coexist. It's probably bad, but in large companies, and much of your message has to do with diversity, equity, and inclus- inclusivity, inclusion. I'm never sure which word I want to use there. Inclusivity or inclusion. Hmm. Now is not the time to debate it, but much of your, whatever, I'm going to lean into that, right? There's my self-honesty. Move on, Amy. There's a better, <laughs> so much of, but much of your message is about DEI. How have you brought that into, you know, the workplace? Um, so it, it's a, it's a journey that became, began like 20 plus years ago before companies were developing, um, employee resource groups, business resource groups before there were chief sure. diversity officers. And it stemmed from my experience of being the only in the room, the yeah. only female executive, the youngest, the only queer person, but also, um, my first executive role was, um, in an outsourcing organization. So large think t- out, companies that outsource tech support, customer service, sales, that kind of thing. Sure, That's not always a destination job. It's new immigrants to the country, people who are in between right. career. Uh, right. So massive turnover. We're talking like 250, 300% per year. What I recognize is, oh, I had incredible diversity of workforce. But if I wanted to get people to stay longer and to feel engaged, I needed to create an environment for them where they too didn't feel like they were the only. And so right. it began without, again, this sort of 
conscious that the vernacular around it. So that's where it started. And then over the last 15 or so years, there's been more formalized DEI programs and initiatives. And so I lead usually both the women's um, resource groups and often the LGBT uh, as well. But for me, DEI, um, you know, is it's more about the sense of belonging we all have. And when we feel like we can show up our authentic selves, like it translates to, this isn't just, and I talk to business leaders, this is not just the right thing to do, create a diverse and inclusive culture. Like this drives business results. Stop thinking oh, sure. about the investment or spend you're making in cheap diversity offers and, and, and you know, um, putting a float in the pride parade and doing all these kind of things. It is good for business. People who feel like they can show up themselves are more engaged, so you retain them longer, so you don't have turnover costs, lost productivity costs, and they're generally more highly productive. So you see both top and bottom line dollars. So for me, I was doing it because of how I felt, but also seeing what it delivered in business. And now it's just, it's a core part of it. It's just a value you said. You see it. It's on my website. It's everywhere. Um, right. And it's just because I think I'm looking for workforces and companies, communities in the world at large, just to be much more inclusive holistically. Yeah. I, I haven't had the same level of, of executive experience you have. I will say though, that, that that's always been sort of a core value of any team that I've been a part of, that if you don't have a sense of belonging, you don't really have a team. You have a set of people who are interested in doing their own thing. And, and if you can foster that sense of belonging, that sense of a common purpose, like that's how you get teams that become highly functional. Not, not by, you know, the bringing pizza in or something like that, you know, <laughs> to a meeting or, or whatever, these sort of token gestures toward, oh, we're all in this together, despite the fact that I'm the CEO and I'm going to go off skiing while you guys are working 80 hours a week to try to get the thing done. Not that I'm bitter about this, obviously. <laughs> right? <sighs> Bring it back together. But, but it's a great, great point. You have to build a team that, that out operates as a team. Otherwise, you kind of got nothing. So it, it happens. I've had two discussions in about the past month having to do with, with representation, both in, in marketing and then actually something in, in um, representation and fiction. What's your take on those things that I just mentioned, the token gestures at, at DEI in particular? Uh, I... Um... So I, I'm not a fan of the tokenism at all. I, um, right. I, I work for IBM and Ginny Rometty, who was our CEO for many years, you know, had the saying, you cannot be what you cannot see. Sure. Which I love. I mean, there's lots of things about Ginny. I, you know, not, I wasn't a fan of, but that was a great saying of hers. Uh, and I am embraced. And so I think, so it's more than the token of whatever it is, queer person, yeah. person of color, whatever, that we need to be seeing more of it. And it needs to be more reflective of the communities, you know, that we live in. Um, I yeah. mean, it's, and I, I say communities, cause you know, I, I've been in global roles and it's very different in one part of the world, what their, what definite diversity means and how it's defined there versus sure. here. Sure. And so I, I'm looking for real, diversity across this spectrum. So not just gender and sexuality, race and religion, um, neurodiversity, abilities, mm -hmm. lived and work experience, those kind of things. I want to see more of that, but that also goes back to comfort level and in a sense of belonging, people willing to share some of those things that aren't obvious. Right. Um, I actually, this, that plays directly into a great next topic because you're also big on making a personal brand mm. and part of how you end up figuring out if a team's going to fit together is is everybody has to be honest with the team which kind of starts with being honest with yourself I, so i gotta tell you so for 25 years worth of technology career i wanted to be as nameless and faceless as possible because it was kind of difficult i mean there were many reasons for that you know obviously Gender dysphoria didn't help in this regard, but I also really, no, actually, I maybe just, maybe just want to leave it at that. I didn't want to tell any team who I truly was. Mm. I didn't want to develop a personal brand because if I did, I'd have to go, oh gosh, my personal brand is 
you know, what you're looking at now as opposed to what they were looking at 10 years ago. So, but let's talk personal brands because now I'm, now I'm developing one. I think I just did it. <laughs> so I don't know why this gesture has shown up in many of my conversations recently, but, but tell me, I mean, is this, is it just defining who we are? Is it just, well, let me stop. What is no, a personal it, um, brand? So personal brand, I think from a professional or business perspective, most people stop at one thing. And that is what's my subject matter expertise? Like, you know, what mm. did I go to school for? What, like, have I been working in or what industry am I known for that? So that, that is a part of it, but People do business with people they like and trust and want to do business with. Right. And to stand out and differentiate yourself, whether it's uh, to have someone hire or promote you or for people to want to contract or buy from you, um, it needs to be more than that. And so I do think you need to, there's a, it, it's a lot harder than people think to develop a strong personal brand. And you are the CEO of Brandio. And so you develop the narrative that you want the world to know. And, and it's not, we're not actors on a stage here, but know your audience, know your goals and objectives. And then you need to show four broad elements, I think, as are, are key to your brand. The first one I said, subject matter expertise that builds credibility around the space that you work in. And there can be multiple. Like, so I have a, I'm a corporate executive. My side hustle has always been to be a public speaker. Now they're, the audience is often the same, but not always. Um, but you could have a side hustle, a passion project, right? So that, that first bucket can be more than one thing. But then the next one is around storytelling. Who are you as a human? What are your interests, your values, your passions? Perhaps you want to share some of your lived experiences that make you you. My, li sure. my origin story and Julie, that's a part of that. Very connected to it, and sometimes they're the same thing, um, but is... What makes you different from others? So sure. again, if all things being equal, why would someone hire or buy from, you know, consultant A versus consultant B, let's say, what makes you different from me? I talked about radical candor. I've spent the last many, many years in the world of management consulting and professional services, and many consultants tell clients what they want to hear, not what they actually need to hear. So for me, that's, that's a differentiator. No. I build trust because I tell people <laughs> no, and I tell them what right. they need to hear. <laughs> right. <laughs> so figure out the differentiation. As I said, sometimes it's still connected to who you are, interest, values, passion. So my values are, are both something in my storytelling, but also my differentiation. And then the last piece is legacy. And what do you want to be known for? And this is where you start to think like, what's that narrative? You know, you don't want people making up like, when, when you're not in the room, something that you haven't curated the message for. So for me, legacy and impact, right. and it's shifted and changed over time. At 20 something years old, my defi definition of success and what I wanted to be known for was likely hiring up, you know, going higher up the corporate ladder, um, making more money, material wealth and possessions. And then sure. that totally shifted. And that's, that's not at all what I want to be known for. Yes, I've been really successful in business, but I, I want to be known for one, raising two really good human beings in my two children, uh, but also leaving the world, that, well, workplace, community, world, a better place when I left it than when I came in. And so you need yeah. to think of all of those pieces. But to your question, Ami, I think there's, what are you comfortable sharing with the world? What's the goal and objective you have for building your brand? Who's your audience? Where is your audience? And then how do you showcase, you know, the, the brand once you've figured all that out? Sure. I, it's funny because you went, you, you summed up with the point I wanted to ask, because, I mean, that's difficult. That's difficult for a company to say, you know, what do you want to, to display to the world? It's, you know, it's even more difficult for like a person, you know, who are you going to be? Who you, you know, who do you want, who do you want to be seen as? Because most of us want to be seen as what you're saying, you know, as, uh, as, or as what you were saying was a, your original sort of, you know, motivation. We want to be seen as like the billionaire, you know, the pretty blonde, you know, billionaire. And, and yet each of us is so much more, you know, that lasted you through your twenties maybe, but, uh. You know, it's difficult for a, for a company, even more difficult for one of us. What's a process even to get started on that? 
Um, well, funny. I So I said I'm in career transition. So I use this time because I'm not very good at idle, being idle, to write two books. Sure. The one that just came out a few weeks ago on personal branding. And I wrote it in large part because I not only do I talk about it, I coach people, but I just see people getting it really, really wrong. Um, and so it it's a, and the other one's a leadership book that will come out later this year. Uh, but it, um, you need to go through, we talked at the beginning of this discussion around self-awareness and self-reflection. You need to know who you are, um, and maybe who you will become, because I think when you start to talk about the end in mind and think about legacy, some of it's aspirational. Um, we haven't yet arrived, if you will, um, at that. But I, so I think you need to be really aware of that, um, of who, again, who, who are you? Um, and then what are you going to show to the world? So there's a framework that I take people through to go through those, you know, brand foundational elements that I spoke through. And I encourage people to work with people who are going to give them a perspective, how they're perceived today. So I told you I wore a mask, no vulnerability, no emotion in my twenties. I got a nickname as the Iron Maiden. Not proud of that. Cause that's actually not who I am. Like I'm my best friends nickname me Turtle, um, and we have mat- that, those matching tattoos, and that's because it. I'm very resilient, tough exterior, but I'm like soft and marshmallowy on side on the inside. <laughs> but perception's reality, and so I was yeah. being perceived as this tough, heartless executive who made these really tough de- decisions all the time. And so, going through the exercise of figuring out who you are having it tested against how you are perceived externally and then really building um, a plan with strategic intentionality. I use that phrase all the time, but being really strategic about how you're going to build your brand, where you're going to do it, who's your audience, why are you doing it? Like I see people requesting Mm -hmm. when I say people getting it wrong, like LinkedIn has an out their algorithm right now, where if you take a selfie um, and then post some content that's higher in the algorithm. And so I see all these people just posting selfies every single day with nonsensical bullshit and they're posting in LinkedIn amplification sure. groups saying, can you like sure. comment? Like why, why is this connected to your brand? Is it just so you can yeah. go viral so you can feel good because you have likes or is it truly intentionally building a strong brand? So you become a thought leader in a, B or C or people know, you know, what values you're aligned to. Right. Um, I actually want to, I, w- I would love to talk a little bit more about that actually, because, um, do, do you remember, did you ever go through the Franklin Covey process, that whole, like, okay, because <laughs> one of the things, I swear this is, I'm not going to say it's great, because one of the things, uh, one of the steps is to start with the end in mind, which is, you know, the what you said there, the idea of saying, how do you, what, what is going to be your legacy? And so you go, oh, I want people, you know, when I'm on my deathbed, deathbed, I want people to come up and say, oh, Amy, you were such a wonderful parent and you always had, you know, beautiful hair. It was the best <laughs> I had. Someday, my, hopefully my son, you know, can like fill me in on some of the things that I did. But at this point, all I got, you know, beautiful hair. So, but shoot, now I've derailed my own point. Oh, <laughs> so starting from the, the end in mind though, right? You need to have a why. You can't just go, I want to be a good parent. Well, why? What's important about being a good parent I mean, that was something, frankly, I'm sorry, you know, Benjamin Franklin, I'm sorry, Stephen Covey, but like, what the hell difference did that make? If you go, well, here are all the things I want to do. And you go, well, these are goals. Why were they good goals? Because typically I threw them out by like February and I was doing something else. So starting with the end in mind, though, I think means that you, that you start with a really foundational aspect of why you're doing what you're doing really who you are um i think i just talked for like two minutes there and it ended up with about 40 jokes do you, <laughs> where can we go from there that'll bring us back on track help me out. <laughs> well i i do so i i'm a big proponent end in mind legacy and impact particularly when you think about brand but and then it gets woven into everything that you do like i think you know so for me yes legacy and impact. I want to be known for the work I do on social justice and creating better workplaces and communities in a world at large. So if you say, you know, talk about, you know, why being a, well, I want to have set a great example for my children in doing that. So they will, maybe they choose, I don't expect my children to follow in my footsteps, but I'd love if they're, they, at least from a social justice and equity and standpoint, you know, we're 
to, to follow in some of those. They might not choose the same yeah. career as me, but that that's why that goal or objective of raising two really good humans is still connected to, you know, how I think about legacy and impact. But what I'd also tell your listeners is again, it, it's okay. It's going to evolve and change over time. And you may pivot, like I said, and a lot just has to do with age and maturity. What I thought was important in my teens into my twenties vastly changed, you know, as I started to age and got into my thirties and now my late forties. Mm-hmm. These are things we need, really need to write down as well. Cause I think, I, you know, one of the things that actually kind of aligns with what you're saying is, you know, I want to build, uh, I want to create new leaders. It's part of, part of how I put it, part of my ways, my why statement, but create it. But if I hadn't written that down, it's like, well, what, what's that even say, you know, create new leaders. Does that mean just making my son a better person, which hopefully has been true. Who knows, but inspiring others, by example, that's that's a, a, a greater sort of a greater, more, you know, more broad uh, purpose. So I, I say we sh- we need to write them down. But I mean, is that an aspect of the process that you? Uh... Yeah, exactly. Okay. And now I'm no longer a like paper, paper girl, although I totally had the like Franklin Covey, the zipped leather zip, you know, day timer or whatever. So I've evolved. Uh, <laughs> So I'm, I'm not, I'm like, I'm paperless, but I do think you need to go through whether it is physical paper or digital electronic format of yeah. like really curating all of those elements, goals, objectives, your brand, all of those things and capturing them. Right. I am not a vision board kind of person, um, but if that is what helps you, like I am extreme, I have the ability to see vision um, you know, around whether it's design in the home or whatever, without needing to physically see it written down. But for some people, I think if that's what you need, then hell stick up, get all the, like the magazine cutouts you want and have that there for you as a reminder every day. You know, for me, it's here. Um, and I use gym time. And I, I, I fitness fanatic workout every morning. Like that's a time where I'm incredibly reflective planning my day, thinking about how I'm going to achieve goals and objectives. So, so it's in here for me, but I think for others, you definitely need it like written down electronically or otherwise. Yeah. I'm curious, a little bit of a tangent. Are you, do you do any kind of journaling? I mean, do you like to sort of write for yourself as the only audience? Uh, I don't anymore. I did it a lot when I was young. Uh, but now I, I don't do it. Uh, both, My now husband, I was married to a woman for 11 years, now married to a man, um, and my best friend are the two who have to hear it. So for me, the process I go through (laughs) is they're the person who hear the verbal diarrhea. You know, I just need to talk through my day. I often not even asking for advice. That is the process in which I go through um, to expel and process things rather than journaling. I see. I see. What, What changed? I mean, you said you did it earlier in life. What changed? Yeah, I had a diary when I was young. Um, and at some point it stopped. I don't, I don't know why. Um, I just, okay. maybe, maybe I felt it was like, I feel like I probably start, stopped doing it in my late teens and whether no excuses, as I said, I'll hold myself accountable, but I suspect at the time it was a matter of lack of time. I worked multiple mm-hmm. jobs. I like, and so I just think that was probably the one thing I let fall to the wayside. Sure. You, you've also brought up radical candor many times. And if part of what I like to do in a journal is tell, tell myself all those things, I'm not going to tell anybody else. So if, if you're good at telling everybody everything, I suppose it makes some sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not good at that. I'm much better at talking to myself and saying, here are the things I believe. So, and then sometimes they end up coming out of my journal into, uh, you know, into the world. I'm not going to bring any of them up right now, but <laughs> there you go. So I, I have one more, one more major question I'd like to ask you. Unstoppable is a big, huge aspect. It's all over your website. And I think it's an awesome, I think it's an awesome concept. How do we go from being a victim to being unstoppable? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, so it's the unstoppable mantra is, well, is my life's philosophy. And I speak so openly about it because I want people to understand 
that they don't have to be victims. Uh, And going back to, we have choice in terms of how we move forward. Shit's going to happen, adversity, obstacles, trauma. uh, And um, we don't need to let that prevent us from being happy and achieving whatever your definition of success is, whatever that is, that goal and objective. We do not need to let any of that stop us. And it's hard work though. It is, uh, in it's incredibly uncomfortable. And by the way, it's very easy to play the victim or just to blame others for circumstance and not take accountability and control for how we move forward. I have one monkey wrench. I just uh, would want to throw out there. There are states, I mean, you know, I'm transgender. There are states right now limiting access to transgender care, right? And this is not, this is legislation. Mm -hmm. Many of my, my transgender brothers and sisters don't, there is no way around it. You're right. And so I think that, well, I mean, so there are things that you cannot control, but this is where I would encourage, how, how do you take control back and what, what alternative mm-hmm. choices can you, what can you make? Can you move to a state? Now that I, I get it, that, like that creates a whole other dynamic. And if you've got partners and kids and fit, like, sure. I, I understand that. Um, but I think of, I look at my youngest one, Jordan, who, um, you know, it suffered from bipolar and some substance abuse and went to rehab, um, and then declared, you know, that he's trans male. Um, and we had to go through this evaluation of what makes the most sense after coming out of rehab in, um, in Pennsylvania, was it to come back to South Florida where I live currently? And I was like, Wait, and, and Florida doesn't historically have a great track record for transgender, you know, care. Right. So, and so now this is me as the supportive parent, but I just, I would hope that Jordan might make this decision for himself potentially. But I said, coming back to Florida is probably not the best for you as a trans yeah. male beginning your journey. Yeah. It's also, <laughs> you can get drugs anywhere, but Miami's really, really, it's far <laughs> too accessible, I believe. So let's Good make point. some choices. And so Jordan's now living back in Canada, who, by the way, oh, will have, you know, that, you know, the trans journey paid for it. Some it's a long process. Uh, but yeah, like, and there's yeah. much more, it's a much more supportive, inclusive, um, country as a whole. And so I just, I will always say control what you can control, uh, you know, for, you know, for our trans family, it's hard. Uh, you know, so the, you know, lots of things I would say in terms of encouragement and finding podcasts like this, finding resources and people who are going to support you, but, and to the extent that you can make demonstrable change to move or be in a place where you will be supported, um, you know, you know, would be my, my advice and recommendation. Right. I have to, I mean, your support was to send your child away so that he can be the person he is. I mean, I, I'm sorry. Hopefully that didn't trigger. No, no, it just it, it it saddens, saddens me because I much rather, you know, be close and be able to, you know, squeeze and hug Jordan in on a daily basis, but it's, of course, yeah. but best thing for but, the best thing for Jordan, um, who gets my financial support to live elsewhere uh, and be in a place um, to get the healthcare and treatment and communal support, uh, meant you know sending him away. Sure, I, I guess I just want. I mean, on behalf, I probably shouldn't speak for the transgender community, but you know, on behalf of our community, I mean, you know, thank you for recognizing like that difficulty because it's not. Typical. I think Mm. many, many people would say, I'd rather have you suffer. I'd rather, you know, my child, I'd rather have you suffer than, you know, be the person you are. I believe this is the source of so much of the legislation we're looking at. Rather have you suffer than be the person you are, because I just don't like, you know, just don't like that person. So, so thank you. Now I'm going to end up crying. Uh, (laughs) It's, but you know, it's a, it's a topic close to my heart, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
anyway, thank you so much. The, the, um, this conversation has been awesome and I see we're running out of time. I feel like there's so much more knowledge I could, I could pull out of you. Um, that came out sounding kind of weird, a little creepy. (laughs) No, but (laughs) I think I'll just say, listen, um, you know, thank you to my listeners. Thank you, Victoria Peltier. Um, I'm Amethyst Herrick. This is Gender Identity Weekly. I'm talking with Victoria Peltier. You can find her at victoria-peltier.com. Being an unstoppable. Victoria, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.